Hello, welcome to National Women's History Museum. Today, we're going to talk about Katherine Johnson and the mathematics of space. So some of you may have seen the movie Hidden Figures, which retold the story of three African-American women who worked at NASA during the 1950s space race. Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson were three of the thousands of women who worked at NASA Langley from the 1920s until the 1970s as human computers. So you may be asking yourselves, who were these women? What did they do? And why were they called human computers? Well, at first, they worked on the problem of how to build a better airplane. This is a photo of the NACA staff in 1943. Notice the women in the front row of this photo. Right? Before NASA, there was NACA. And NACA stands for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. It was formed in 1915 to advise airplane manufacturers on how to make a better airplane. By 1920, NACA had its own research facility at Langley Field in Hampton, Virginia. First dozens and then hundreds of engineers came to work on improving airplane designs. Uh, and this is really complex stuff. It requires an advanced mathematics skill. So the engineers at first were doing all of their own calculations, which was really slow going. In order to speed things up, NACA began hiring mathematicians to figure out equations for the engineering teams, because this is before the invention of the electronic computer. By the 1940s, women were filling most of the jobs as the human computers. So this is how it would work. An engineer would tell a computer which equations they wanted a computer to solve and the calculations they needed them to perform. So for example, we're going to look at a calculating sheet from that time period. The figures in column one might be added to figures in column two, and then the results put into column four. Each of the computers were given a constant and were told to arrive at a coefficient. And then the engineers took that information and they applied it back to their aircraft design. Let's take a minute just to talk about mathematics and what it was the computers were actually doing. So an equation is a mathematical sentence that says that two things or an expression are equal. And a linear equation gives you a straight line when you plot it on a graph. So an example of a linear equation would be 7 plus 2 is equal to the same thing as 11 minus 2, right? Both sides of the equation actually equal 9, okay? So the calculation is the steps that you go through to solve the equation. A variable is the symbol for an unknown number. That's usually a letter at the end of the alphabet, like an X, a Y, or a Z. A number on its own is a constant, and a coefficient is the number that's used to multiply the variable. So in the equation, A, X, plus B, X, equals c. We have x is the variable, a and b are coefficients, and c is the constant. We're going to show you a page now from Betty Stafford Malone's notebook, and she's showing the equation for calculating Mach numbers in shock waves. Right? So she's one of the computers who kept track of her work as she was going along. Now, what they were doing was applying these calculations so that they could learn more about how to make a more efficient aircraft. And in order to understand that, we're going to spend a second talking about how airplanes fly. Right? An airplane flies because of lift. Right? So slow moving air on the bottom of the wing exerts greater pressure than the faster moving air on the top. And it's this difference in pressure that creates lift, which is the force, that raises the wings and the plane, or if it's a bird, to ascend into the sky. And smooth air flowing over the wing and around the wing means that the air can fly through the, the wing, the airplane can fly through the sky with minimum friction. Tur 
turbulent flow slows it down and makes it much harder to maneuver. So the goal is to have a really efficient airplane design so that air is flowing very smoothly over all of the different components. Now, an aircraft actually moves on three different planes. Roll is the side-to-side -side movement on a longitudinal or front-to-back axis. Pitch is the rotation kind of side-to-side -side on a lateral or transverse axis where the nose and the tail go up and down in opposition. And yaw is the rotation around the vertical axis on the left to right. So all of these factors are needed to be able to control the airplane and keep it in the air. And the better the air flow around the airplane, the better able the pilot is to keep the airplane in the sky and the faster it can fly. So NACA's lab tested a lot of different aircraft designs that were submitted by manufacturers and made recommendations back to them for how to make them better. They did this using wind tunnels. And we have a picture of a wind tunnel, which is actually from 1948. And in this photo of the wind tunnel, you can see that the model of the airplane is set up uh, inside this closed space. Eventually, NACA and then NASA had a number of different tunnels in different sizes that were set up to test different parts of an airplane under different conditions. It works by putting the model or the full size piece into the tunnel and blowing wind over it. They discovered that an airplane having air blown over it while it was stationary for the purposes of testing is nearly the same thing as an airplane moving through the air at the same wind speed. So in this wind tunnel, they're measuring the airflow and pressure. Next, we have a picture of women who are on the other side of the wind tunnel looking at monometer boards, and it's this picture as well. So the women in this picture are looking at these liquid-filled tubes, and these tubes are relaying information about air pressure changes around the object in the wind tunnel. And as they look at the tubes, they're recording this data on worksheets. And this woman's actually even saying it out loud into a speaker that somebody else is listening to. They then take that data and they run different calculations to analyze the data and plot the results on a graph. The engineers give formulas to the computers to calculate using variables from these and other measurements. Uh, we have a photo coming up of a woman who's a human computer who's using a microscope to actually read film negatives of these measurements. Okay? And she's writing the results onto a table. She's then going to use the calculating machine that's on the table next to her to solve the engineer's equations. The human computers who worked at NACA and NASA were doing the math that today would be done by a graphing calculator or a digital computer. And then the results were published in research reports. The tables that they're putting the data into show the calculations that the computers are finding for the efficiency of roll, yaw, lift, and drag. Okay. So we're going to do an experiment with our very own kind of a simulated wind tunnel. This is going to be our uh, aerodynamic flying device that we're going to test. So if you look at this particular shape, is this an efficient or a not efficient shape? So I hope you said it's an efficient shape because it's very smooth and air should flow very efficiently over the bottom. Okay. In order to make it stable though, we're going to add um, a set of fins to it. So here I have a particular fin design that is, actually I'm going to use this one, this fin design. They're triangular. Okay. Okay. All right. and now we're going to step back and create our wind tunnel experiment and see how efficient this shape is. Is this rocket moving efficiently or not efficiently? actually moving pretty efficiently. Let's try a different shape to see what effect the shape has on flight. So here we have a rounded fin, which you think might be more efficient, but let's see. Ready? 
and just set up our wind tunnel, and around it goes. Right? Is this a more or less efficient shape? It's actually less efficient because it wasn't leading with its nose, it was leading with the side. Did you notice? You can try this experiment in your classroom and use the foam to cut different shapes of fins to attach to your flying device, to your rocket ship. So when they're in the wind tunnel, what they're measuring is the laminar versus the viscous air flow. If it's viscous, there needs to be a change in design in order to get it to be more laminar, which means essentially smoother or more efficient. Let's spend a couple minutes talking about some of the women who are actually working on these experiments. So let's go back to hidden figures. If you've seen the movie, then you know Dorothy Vaughn, Katherine Jackson, and Mar Katherine Johnson and Mary Jackson. So we have an image here, picture of Mary Jackson. She was hired in 1951 as a clerk typist. She'd been a math major in college, and then she went on to work as a school teacher. And she became one of the very few women to rise out of the computer pool and become an engineer. So NASA, in fact, thinks that she was the first black female aeronautical engineer in the United States. She worked for NASA for 34 years. Dorothy Vaughn, we're going to show you next, came to Langley in 1943. And she came in response to what was called the war manpower shortage. A lot of men had been... Uh, inducted into the Army through the draft for World War II, and they left a lot of open jobs. And NASA also had the need to create more jobs in response to World War II. And Dorothy Vaughn was part of the group of the first African-American women who were recruited to work as computers. She had also been a math major in college, and she had worked as a school teacher for a number of years. She was eventually promoted to supervise the West Computer Pool in 1949, which made her NASA's first black supervisor, male or female. She also went on to write a handbook that explained how to use those calculating machines to perform algebraic equations. And later she went on to become an expert at Fortran programming. Uh, when she became a computer at Langley, her pay uh, nearly doubled from what she had been making as a school teacher. And that was one of the reasons why a lot of women who had been math school teachers quit those jobs to go work for the government during World War II. As the number of open positions grew, an awful lot of women were also recruited right out of college. There were many more women who were majoring in mathematics in the 1930s and 40s than there are today because most of those women planned to go on to become school teachers. Women today have a few more options. The last picture we're going to show you is Katherine Johnson. She was actually hired in 1942, so after that World War II wave of women coming in. And she worked with Dorothy Vaughn's group for about two weeks before she was transferred to an engineering team in the Flight Research Division. And her job, like the rest of the computers, was to perform calculations. In 1958, she was assigned to the Aerospace Mechanics Division and her group was working on the design of the craft that would launch the first American astronauts into space. This is aerodynamic design at its very highest level. So the problem that NASA had was the design of the spacecraft that would put Americans into orbit. They needed a shape that would work very efficiently going up and down. So let's think about what kind of a shape that would be for a minute. You know, a lot of people think that a rounded shape, and here we have an example of a rocket that's very round, is going to be a great choice because it's really efficient. And it's true, a rounded rocket or a needle-shaped rocket is extremely efficient when it goes up, but it's also extremely efficient when it goes down. And when gravity starts to exert its forces on the shape, it's actually a little bit too efficient because it comes down too quickly and is too hard to control. So they started looking at shapes that were going to be less efficient on the way down. So here we have what's almost a model of the Mercury, uh, the Mercury capsule. So this shape, because it is blunt, doesn't go up as well, but when it comes down, this blunt force body creates a shock wave as it comes down down to earth, which dissipates heat 
and keeps the person inside safe. So it's much more controllable and safer and works better with gravity on the way back down. We have an image of the mercury capsule. And if you look at that image of the person inside, it actually has a pretty strong resemblance to the solo cup. Now launching that capsule into space requires a lot of force. And the Redstone rocket became the delivery device. And over here on the wall, we have a picture of the Redstone rocket. So up here is the capsule. There is this shape on top of it, which helps give it that efficiency of design and aerodynamic design to get it up through the atmosphere. And this gives it the force that's going to launch it through the atmosphere, break free of gravity, and go into space. Once it's aloft, that redstone rocket falls away, and you're left with just the capsule that's orbiting the Earth. Okay. So let's take a second and think about how this delivery system is going to work. We're going to launch a rocket into space. Okay. So here is my rocket. Here's my rocket, just kind of capsule shaped. And since this is going to be a science experiment, we're going to be very safe okay, with my glasses. Okay, so the mixture of fuel that's going to go into the rocket is a little bit of vinegar. Okay. And here I have some baking soda. This is also an experiment that you can do in the classroom. Actually, I recommend that you don't do it in the classroom. I recommend that you do it outside and give yourself lots of space. Okay, so I'm going to take the baking soda, put it into this little delivery device, close up my rocket, and get ready to launch. Sometimes it takes a second. So as you can see, the force of the explosion pushes the capsule to break free of the atmosphere and enter orbit. And this is what's called an uncontrolled launch because the force happens when the force happens. Okay. So Katherine Johnson for Alan Shepard's Mercury mission on Freedom 7 was working on the trajectories. So the rocket goes up, but the question is where is it going to come back down? This is called a parabolic curve. And I think some of you, if we look at this next image, are really familiar with the concept of parabolic curves and calculating launch trajectories, particularly if you enjoy playing Angry Birds on your phone. So Alan Shepard's flight was planned to be a parabolic curve. And we have an image from NASA that was put out at the time that explains the concept. Uh, a quadratic equation is used to calculate the graph of the curve. And the variable is squared. So the standard form of a quadratic equation, we're going to go back to math, is ax squared right, plus b x plus c is equal to zero. Okay. So the engineers on Catherine's desk had the responsibility to calculate these trajectories and trace out in very painstaking detail the exact path that the spacecraft would travel across the Earth's surface from the second it lifted off the launch pad until the moment it splashed down in the Atlantic. So Earth's gravity is exerting a force on the satellite, and it has to be accounted for in the trajectories system of equations. So here's the Earth, right? The Earth is actually what's called oblate, which means it's not perfectly round or spherical, but it's slightly squat. And this is a great example of a slightly squat Earth, right? And so this needed to be specified in the calculations, as did the speed of the planet's rotation. Because keep in mind that as the rocket is going up in the air from its launch location and it's moving in orbit, the Earth is also moving in orbit. So these are all of the different factors that you need to account for. 
So even if the capsule were to shoot off into the air directly overhead and come back down on a completely straight line, it's not going to come down in the, in the same spot because the Earth is moved. So Katherine Johnson said, tell me where you want the man to land and I will tell you where to send him up. So over the months of 1959, the 34-page end product took shape. There were 22 principal equations, nine error equations, two launch case studies, three reference texts, two tables with sample calculations, and three pages of charts. And Alan Shepard's Freedom 7 went into suborbital flight at 116 and a half miles above the Earth on May 5th, 1961. We're going to show you a clip of that from YouTube. So Ellen Shepard became the first American in space. Katherine Johnson helped him get back down using math. Thanks for joining us today. Please visit our website at www.womenshistory.org to learn more about women in STEM careers, women in NASA, and women's history. Thanks for joining us.